Welcome to my talk about the influence of static and dynamic epitaxial strain on Lanthanum's strontium manganite ultra-thin films. Lanthanum strontium manganite, or LSMO for short, is a perovskite-type material. Under ideal circumstances, it is cubic perovskite, as schematically shown on the right. However, in thin film form, it usually forms a rhombohedral structure. In bulk form, it is ferromagnetic about 370 Kelvin. It shows colossal magnetoresistance and almost 100% spin polarization, making it a half metal. All of the above properties make it an auspicious candidate in the field of spintronics. The ferromagnetic ordering of LSMO has been explained by the Zener double exchange interaction, where an energy electron transfer between manganese 3 plus and manganese 4 plus ions takes place via the oxygen 2p state. You can see a sketch of the interaction on the right. The probability of this transfer is dependent on the manganese oxide geometry and as such is influenced by epitaxial strain. Thus, the ferromagnetic properties of LSMO are dependent on the epitaxial strain of the thin film. In order to investigate the effects of epitaxial strain, we have prepared four samples of thin film LSMO of approximately 25 nanometers by pulse laser deposition. The four samples are deposited on four substrates with varying degree of epitaxial strain, ranging from high compressive on lanthanum aluminate to low compressive on lanthanum aluminium strontium aluminium tantalate, which took me about 15 tries to pronounce correctly, to low tensile on strontium titanate, all the way to high tensile strain on dysprosium scandate. The ferromagnetic properties of the four samples have been investigated by magneto-optical spectroscopy. Magneto-optical spectroscopy measures the so-called magneto-optical Kerr effect, or MOG for short. MOG for an incident S polarized wave is the ratio of the complex amplitudes of the reflected P and S polarized waves, respectively, and it corresponds approximately to the rotation of the polarization ellipse in the real part and its ellipticity in the imaginary part. The magneto-optical current effect is a measure of magnetically induced optical anisotropy. This effect is tied to the permittivity tensor through Yek's formalism. The resulting magneto-optical spectra of the four samples can be seen on the right with obvious deterioration of magnetic properties with increasing lattice mismatch, as the thin films deposited on LAO and DSO had to be multiplied tenfold to be shown on the same scale. All spectra are dominated by a diamagnetic transition at around 3.6 electron volts, with the notable exception of LSMO on STO, they all share the similar spectral shape. The spectra of LSMO and STO show a notable second peak at around 3.6 electron volts, which is caused by the optical influence of STO. In the magneto-optical spectra, we can also see a transition at around 2.4 electron volts. This is shared by all of the samples. For better analysis, we can use these spectra to calculate the off-diagonal elements of the permittivity tensor. But before we do, let me first show this one slide to remind ourselves of the types of optical transitions. We consider two types of transitions. The first type of transition is the double transition, or what is sometimes referred to as a diamagnetic transition due to historical reasons. This is a transition between the ground state and an excited state that is split due to the combined effects of spin-orbit coupling and the exchange field. This transition manifests itself as a bell-shaped curve in the real part of the off-diagonal permittivity tensor, and the imaginary part shows a dispersive relation around the center frequency. The second type of transitions 
arise from splitting of the ground state and thus unequal oscillator strength for the right hand and left hand polarized light. As the occupation of the split ground state is temperature dependent, so is the type 2 transition probability. These transitions are often called single transitions or paramagnetic transitions and manifest themselves as a dispersive relation in the real part and a bell-shaped curve in the imaginary part of the off-diagonal elements of the permittivity tensor. On the left side of the slide, the splitting of the manganese 3D energy levels is illustrated. At the center, we have the 3D levels of an isolated manganese atom. Next to it, we have the split levels of the atom surrounded by six oxygen atoms in a perfect cubic crystal. To the sides, we have the effects of epitaxial strain on the energy levels. On the left side, we have the compressed crystal, whereas on the right side, we have a tensile distortion to the crystal. We numerically calculated the off-diagonal elements of the permittivity tensor using the YECH formalism from the MOOC spectra and the optical and physical properties of the samples. Here, the same observations apply as on the slide with the magneto-optical spectra, except for the optical influence of the SDO substrate, which has now been separated from the spectra. We can clearly observe the transition number two, which is a charge transfer transition from oxygen 2p state to the manganese T2g state in the minority spin channel. It has already been reported in literature, as has been the paramagnetic electronic transition number one, between the manganese T2G and EG states in the majority spin channel. However, for the samples grown under compressive strain, that would be the full lines. A third, not previously reported transition is observable at around 4.3 electron volts and has been characterized by my colleague as paramagnetic and originating in the manganese T2G levels in the majority spin channel. Our future explorations are focused on temperature-dependent measurements. The most noteworthy reason for those is the temperature-related structural transition of the substrate, such as SDO, which induces great strain in the deposited thin film. Such strong dynamic strain can then be observed and provide much more nuanced information than the static changes of the epitaxial strain through deposition on different substrates. Such strain can also be much higher than that achieved by a piezoelectric underlayer. We have carried out a few pioneer measurements into the temperature-related problematic. Their precision is lower than that of the previously mentioned measurements due to the use of a neodymium magnet instead of an electromagnet used for the previous measurements. Also observable is the Faraday effect of the windows of the cryostat. These measurements have been done in longitudinal geometry where the field has been applied in the in-plane direction instead of the previous polar geometry with the out-of-plane direction of the field. The real part of the temperature-dependent magneto-optical spectra for all four samples can be seen on these graphs. For the most compressed sample of LSMO on LAO, we can see the transition at 4.3 electron volts becoming more prominent at lower temperatures, proving it to be paramagnetic in nature. The spectra of LSMO on LAO show the most substantial differences in magnitude with temperature. That is due to the field of the magnet being too weak to induce saturation of the magnetization of the sample and due to the spin reorientation transition of LSMO on LAO at around 200 Kelvin. For LSMO on SDO, we observe a change in the spectral shape at around 3.6 electron volts at about 100 Kelvin. As you can see, these blue lines manifest a different magnitude in the two peaks around 3.6 electron volts, where one peak is caused by the diamagnetic transition and the second peak is caused by the optical influence of STO. Also on these spectra, 
we have managed to successfully subtract the Faraday effect of the windows. We managed to do this by measuring the sample above its crew temperature, thus measuring only the Faraday effect of the windows, and then subtracting it from the other spectra. You can see that the spectra are all centered around the zero line, unlike the spectra of the other measurements that trail off, especially in the UV region. For the case of LSMO on ELSA, the most interesting is the measurement at 100 Kelvin. We can arguably observe the transition at 4.3 electron volts becoming more prominent with this temperature. However, a more thorough analysis consisting of the calculations of the orthogonal permittivity tensor would be necessary to draw definite conclusions on this sample. For the sample of LSMO on DSO, we can see that we are at the limit of precision of our pioneer measurement, as the noise-to-signal ratio is quite high. We do not observe any spectral changes for this particular sample. A byproduct of sorts of the before-mentioned temperature-dependent measurements is the dependence of amplitude of the magneto-optical spectra on temperature. This dependence can be used to determine the Curie temperature of the samples. There are numerous ways of determining the Curie temperature. However, using the magneto-optical Kerr effect, for one, is non-destructive. There is no necessity for electrical contacts or any adjustments to the sample at all. Magneto-optical Kerr effect is also a surface technique, allowing us to determine the Curie temperature of a thin film regardless of the magnetic properties of the substrate be it paramagnetic or ferromagnetic. We illustrate the use of this technique on our data. Even though the magneto-optical spectra have been measured using a permanent magnet inside the cryostat itself, we can draw very precise results. If we forego the data around 100 Kelvin where the neodymium magnets undergo a spin reorientation transition, we can see that for LSMO on STO and for LSMO on LSAT, we get very good fits with a very precise Curie temperature that is in agreement with the magnetometric measurements. Moreover, we are even capable of determining the approximate Curie temperature of LSMO on DSO, which was impossible to do using squid magnetometry due to the magnetic anisotropy of DSO. That is all for my presentation the key takeaways of which were the newly observed paramagnetic transition at 4.3 electron volts on compressively strained samples, the clear magnification of said transition on the sample of LSMO on LAO under low temperatures, proving it to be paramagnetic, showing the possibility of using structural transitions of a substrate for inducing substantial epitaxial strain as verified by the LSMO sample on SDO, and lastly, determining the Curie temperatures of the samples by the dependence of the Moog spectra on temperature. This concludes my talk about the influence of static and dynamic epitaxial strain on thin films of LSMO. I will be looking forward to your questions and comments at the conference in September. Have a nice day!